All right, this is the first uh, weekly podcast, and uh, basically, <clears throat> there's so many stories going on in the weed world, so many stories going on in the drug war, that I'm afraid I have to cover more, and I was going to try to do less after the election, but it looks like I have to do more. And what we have is states scrambling to make marijuana reform happen in their own neck of the woods as other states around them are doing reforms and you know people are seeing the returns in Colorado California's on the brink of you know opening up the the world's most massive most unprecedented marijuana marketplace so you got all these things going on and um yeah, I guess I get to cover uh, more stories, so once in a while, maybe a week, once a week, you're going to get a weekly podcast, and I will try to cover a lot, that I can't cover everything, I, you know, if there's something that you think I should be covering more of, please let me know somehow, um, I can only do so much, uh, I don't get paid to do this, I'm just doing this for fun, so, and I, you know, yeah, you can you can go find these stories anywhere. You know, I, I've said this before. And I'll say it again. Somebody asked me in the comment section, "Yo, dude, we can we can go read all these stories by ourselves." We, you know, what what are you doing here? Well, I got an opinion for one thing, and if you don't like that, then don't fucking tune in. I swear, once in a while, if you can't, if that's too much for you. Uh, I don't know what what to tell you, man. YouTube's pretty much like, uh, and I hate to conform to it, but you know, I also don't want to guard, you know, always be on guard and you know, put myself on some kind of leash. Like, if I feel like something is emotionally warranted enough for me to swear about it, then that's just what I'm gonna do. You know, there's not much I can. I don't want to sit here and edit stuff either. I'm not gonna go back through any of these videos and. And do any kind of editing. I ain't got time for this stuff. I don't have time to edit. I don't even really have time to film these videos half the time. To be quite honest. Um, so that's why I do it. Because I, I have a passion for this stuff. I really want to share these stories with people. And yeah, sure, you can go read these stories anywhere you want. But will you? You know, are, Do you even know about half the stories that I've covered? Um, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you have the same people on your feed like Tom Angel and some others, or High Times, or, you know, Weed News, Weed Maps, Mass Roots, Leafly. All these people have editors, all these people have writers, all these people are putting stories out. I'm, I'm not doing anything different, and I'm not breaking any news. I'm just reporting this shit. That's basically, you know, why do you turn on CNN or whatever, you know, dipshitty uh, news channel you watch to get your news. What, why do you turn that on? You can just go get them stories anywhere and read them too, can't you? So I don't understand what that question was about. Um, but, yeah, I essentially do what I have a passion to do. And in my spare time, I do this, which is bring you stories that I've already looked at and read and know a little bit about. And have an opinion because I've been involved with this uh, movement and all this marijuana, um, you know, following these stories. I've been doing this my whole life. All right, well, we're going to start here in Arkansas, where the trend these days is that people, when people pass laws, then the legislator tries to kneecap and neuter the laws. But when the legislator passes laws, you're expected to follow them to the letter, no dragging your feet, no um, holding back when it's time for you to pay taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So we have two medical marijuana measures that zip through the Arkansas House. Uh, a pair of medical marijuana bills that sputtered through a committee last week passed with little opposition in a House vote on Monday. House said licensees would not be able to sell their licenses and any transfers would have to be approved by the Arkansas Medical Marijuana Commission. The commission will be in charge of licensing dispensaries with cultivators under the state system being set up to allow use of the drug for medical reasons. 
It was not totally, it's not a totally free market, he said. We're, we're issuing and licensing people to run it, kind of like railroads. Can everybody have their own railroad? Come on, man. Are you serious? Now, I don't know about Arkansas, but here in Michigan, when we legalize marijuana for medical reasons or any other reason, the people on the ground that get this, uh, that get these ballot signatures, you know, these petition signatures, it's a big effort, a massive effort. As you can see in that background picture in this one, those are boxes full of petitions. Um, so <laughs> these people, you know, they want to have a, a say in the, the product. They want to have a say in it, probably. I don't know. In, in Michigan, the activists were the growers, were people that were doing it illegally in the shadows for decades. And, you know, we weren't going to have this crap where they're treating it like some kind of a, a massive um, public work situation like a railroad. It's not what it is. The marijuana industry is a grassroots thing. It could be run uh, from small grow to small grow, and you can have bigger grows in there. You can even have industrial size grows. You got hemp. There's room for everybody, and there's definitely room for the small people. What the government hates, especially these right wingers down south, I've noticed, is they hate it when people can industriously um, be self sufficient. You know, they want you to be snuggling up to the government while they, you know, tell you how much money you can make and what you can do and regulate you every which way they can. While they tell you, and you know, Republicans like to tell you that they're against regulations and that they're, you know, like they want to cut out all the regulations and coal mining and all these other things where they're drilling for oil. And, you know, they don't want regulations there. They don't want regulations telling them how much uh, waste material they can dump in your rivers or how much carbon they can pollute in, in those smokestacks. Or, you know, what if the nuclear power plant melts down and destroys <laughs> just about everything in the Pacific Ocean? Can't, ev you know, can't everybody have their own railroad? HB 1371, also by House, would require that Arkansans hold 60% ownership interest in dispensaries and cultivation facilities. It also contains a provision that would require natural persons, not corporations, to hold licenses. Now, you know, you see a couple of my videos. I talk about how a lot of these laws have personhood in it as being um, according to, like, the Citizens United kind of state of mind, where a person means anything that has to do with money, like a, a corporation, a lot, limited liability company, um, even a trust is considered a person in, in a lot of these laws. <clears throat> Here, you have a guy who actually wants to distinguish between natural persons and things that are not natural persons. Um, he's got, and of course he got pushback because the Republicans hate it when you tell them that corporations aren't people. So Representative Aaron Pickling, Pinkinston, I don't know, uh, Republican from Clarksville, Asked House if there was a such thing as an unnatural person. That's not what he meant. He didn't mean an unnatural person. He just meant, when you say person, you should be talking about flesh and bone, breathing, talking human being, not a corporation, limited liability company, limited liability corporation, partnership, association, joint venture. Can I impress you anymore, House said. So, you know, back in your face, I hate it when Republicans and politicians in general they answer you with these snide remarks and these snarky answers like, um, you know, is there a such thing as an unnatural person? Yeah, there is. You keep, you guys keep defining these, you know, entities as people that are not people. So, yeah, that's unnatural. I, I think they're like vampires, so they're more like supernatural. They have supernatural abilities to usurp money and not pay taxes is what they do. They get money from the government. They don't pay taxes. The voter-approved Arkansas Medical Marijuana Amendment requires 60% of the owners to be Arkansans, but there's a potential loophole in that provision, House said. If there, was, if there were 10 owners of a dispensary, seven could be Arkansans to satisfy the amendment, but the remaining three out-of-state owners could hold a disproportionately, uh, disproportionately larger share in the organization. So what? <laughs> I mean, I don't understand what that, you know, what the big deal there is. 
All right. The bills are supported by Little Rock-based lawyer David Couch, who sponsored the amendment, and Melissa Fouts, executive director of Drug Policy Education Group, who backed a competing measure uh, that the state Supreme Court rejected during early voting. Hmm, that seems like a little bit of a conflict of interest. I don't see uh, how that's not. But anyway, both bills head to the Senate for, uh, for further consideration. A section on uh, February 14th, 2017. House Bill 1298 by Representative Doug House, a uh, Republican from North Little Rock, would require a license for a dispensary or cultivation operation to be held by a person instead of a business or corporation. The bill also allowed license tra- transfers. It passed 83 to 1. So maybe that did happen. And then another thing going on is you have a bill seeking to ban medical marijuana edibles. And uh, another thing about these these weekly podcasts real fast, and get that in there before people stop watching the clip, um, is I'm not always going to have, you know, these stories aren't going to always be like, wow, this is breaking news. You know, I always I, I always say that I don't break news and all that stuff, but some of these stories might be old news by the time you hear them. You might have already heard them. There might even be an update to some of this that I haven't really went back at the last minute to check for. Um, I'm going to be guilty of that on this time because <clears throat> I had a long day already, so I just wanted to get this clip over with. Um, but in the future, maybe, I will uh, definitely update these stories at the last minute. But I don't think any of these uh, bills have moved anywhere yet since February 13th. But this one seeks to ban edibles because here we go with the overabundance of caution every time medical marijuana is considered, especially in uh, one of those red states, where I guess it's just, you know, unheard of that marijuana would be considered medicine. It's it's the devil's lettuce, my friend. It's the Bible Belt, man. And I've always said the number one enemy of marijuana legalization is not your government. It's your church. And the church, everybody in the government goes to church. It's like part of, it's like a prerequisite. You got to raise your right hand or whatever, put your hand on the Bible. You know, it's always, uh, you got to swear to Jesus or something like that. And I don't know. I, I thought we were a secular country, but apparently there's a, there's just a lot of this church stuff still running the government. And they definitely are the, they're behind a lot of stuff. But the medical, or the marijuana um, pushback is definitely hugely coming from the church. And during the election, the Catholic Church on the East Coast put up, $850,000 to fight legalization on the East Coast. Um, churches on the West Coast got together and had millions of dollars in the pot against uh, legalizing in California and Arizona and Nevada. Um, you know, so that's that's what's going on, man. They're behind a lot of it. Uh, a new bill seeks to limit the way medical marijuana patients could consume the drug. If passed, Senate Bill 333 would outlaw what are known as marijuana edibles. Edibles provide a a way to ingest the drug and feel the effects without having to smoke it. Senator Gary Stubblefield's legislation bans combining medical cannabis with food or drink, which is how edibles are formed and used. It does provide for exceptions in cases where patients qualify. How about just no? How about fuck that? (laughs) Keep that bill. Nobody needs it. Um, there's absolutely nothing dangerous about edibles. There's, if you want to do something about edibles, do it. States that have already had medical marijuana around for a while. Again, and I tell this to all you down south, Bible Belt, redneck hicks. Um, hey, guess what? There's people out there that actually have legalized medical marijuana for a long time, you know, decades in some cases. So look at what they're doing, see how it's working, and you know, apply the best thing that you think is the best. Here's what I think is the best. When you label medibles and you put them in childproof packaging and you have a stamp right on the the edible itself that says that it has THC in it. Might even show how much THC is in it to go one step farther. And that's Colorado. I mean, it's probably like that in most places because places that have medical marijuana looked at Colorado and they said, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. What here? What he's doing here is dumb, and it's going to make a black market underground 
um, blow up because medibles are, are always in huge demand. And the reason primarily is because a lot of people do not like to smoke marijuana or do like dabs or bong hits or whatever, you know, like they don't like to choke on this stuff. Um, and a lot of people need a, a heavy dose of marijuana, which you can't do through smoking too easily. Um, eating it's the best way to do that. The bill was one of two dozen filed this session, aiming to tweak or regulate the medical marijuana amendment passed by voters last November. Psh. Yeah, and every one of these bills is basically designed to take something that is successful in a medical marijuana situation, which, you know, they did go do their research. They looked at what works, and they decided that they don't want that in their program. So they're doing everything they can to make these, these programs not work, and Arkansas is the best example you can point to. Um, if you look at Florida, they're actually listening a little more. They're having listening sessions and stuff. These people don't even care about the constituents. So the bill follows another bill seeking to ban the smoking of medical marijuana. Boom. So if you can't smoke it and you can't eat it, what's, what's even left? All right, you got sives and tinctures and I don't know. That's just, they might even consider a tincture eating it still. So I don't know. Arkansas Legislative Roundup. Senate rejects medical marijuana bill. Um, this is the, uh, the 254. This bill would let the State Medical Marijuana Commission decide whether to allow medical marijuana dispensary to grow marijuana plants. Um, he said you got 16 yes votes and 15 no because it would amend a voter-approved constitutional amendment. It needed two-thirds to pass or 24 votes in a 35-member Senate. Uh, so yes, they're basically trying to ban dispensaries from being able to grow marijuana. Constitutional amendment legalizing medical marijuana that voters approved in November allows a dispensary to grow up to 50 marijuana plants at a time, which isn't very much. That's not very much at all, especially if they're counting everything down to clones and everything. Um, Standridge's bill, so that's not very much, and they wanted to kneecap that. <laughs> Standridge's bill would give the commission control over whether dispensaries could grow marijuana. And believe me, the only reason they wanted to give the commission control is so the commission could say, no, you can't. The bill would not authorize the commission to authorize a dispensary to grow more than 50 plants. So you know what direction they're going. They're going towards zero. They're not going, well, 50 is not enough, especially for your area. You know, you need more because the population is more. Um, it would not affect the ability of cultivation centers to grow marijuana. Uh, cultivation centers in this Arkansas situation something different than dispensaries. Um, not sure exactly what, but so there's there's one state, Arkansas. What's going on there? Here's all these people that are hoping good things. Um, I, I hope the best for you. We're looking at Florida. We're looking at Arkansas. A lot of bad things are going on, but then you have North Dakota. North Dakota is by far the worst state for. Most laws, marijuana laws, yes. Um, now they got now they're trying to pass these laws so that you can't protest because they can run. <laughs> they fortunately they didn't let it pass so that you could run a protester over without getting charged with vehicular manslaughter. Because if you look at those comment section in those videos about Standing Rock where people are blocking roads and stuff, the people in the comment section are like, "Run them over." Um, no, don't run them over. That's First Amendment rights being exercised. And yeah, too bad if you get stuck in traffic on the way home because somebody wants to let you know that there's some pretty bad shit going on. Like international uh, corporations coming in, just taking the land that is somebody else's land, just saying, get out of here. I'm not just talking about the Native Americans, if, if, you, don't like, if you don't like what I'm saying because you're like, oh, whatever. We broke a lot of treaties. Yeah, we, this is a treaty that we're breaking here. You're, you're kicking people off their land. And it's not just them. It's also old white farmers that are getting kicked off their land in Iowa and other places because of this pipeline. And North Dakota, it, it's, it's bad up there. What's going on now? Well, they want more time to mull over their medical marijuana law that got passed, and they have to deal with it. These right-wing states where the medical marijuana gets passed, they hate dealing with it. They're like, what do we got to do? We got to make some rules for this thing, and then we got to promulgate them? What's that even mean? They don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're, they don't even like government. The only reason they're in there is to throw a wrench in the government and let the corporations get away with whatever the fuck they want. 
and they haven't figured out how to take over medical marijuana yet, so he doesn't have a really good blueprint for that. So cut off guard by voters in this highly conservative state approving medical marijuana, North Dakota lawmakers said Monday that more time is needed to implement the law. A rare joint House and Senate meeting was held to consider a proposal to delay the law until the end of July. The so-called emergency measure is supported by both Republican and Democratic leaders who said state health officials and law enforcement are scrambling to solve a number of issues, including allowable forms and potency of medical pot and oversight of distributors. Quote, is it important to uh, allow time to get this right? Democratic Senate major- or Minority Leader jo- uh, Joan Heckman told lawmakers this. The delay measure is expected to pass this week in both chambers, each of which must approve it by two-thirds vote. It's unclear whether the GOP Governor Doug Burgum would sign it. Now, I just said this thing would have to have a two-thirds vote again because it's an amendment and it passed by a lot. It's either an amendment, I'm not sure about that. Uh, uh, anyway, if either way it passed by a, a, a huge landslide, so they need the two thirds, man. They need two thirds to get anything done to this thing. Separate bills introduced next week, uh, will be introduced next week that will suggest regulatory oversight. Lawmakers said again, these are old. This is uh, January 16th, actually. So this has all been done. Um, I don't know what. They're still stuck in there. I didn't see any updates. So February 7th, the update, North Dakota legislator is attempting to roll back the will of the voters. So it was 64% of North Dakotans uh, said yes to medical marijuana. Unfortunately, lawmakers have proposed to alter the program beyond recognition. Um, If passed, Senate Bill 2344 would prohibit whole plant cannabis and other forms of cannabis other than liquids and pills. You can learn more about the benefits of whole plant here all right sb2344 would also eliminate the already very restrictive home cultivation provision which applies only to patients living more than 40 miles from a dispensary the bill would drastically raise costs making the program out of reach for many it undermines the will of voters uh substituting lawmakers judgment for that of their constituents (laughs) so yeah it's they basically are like everybody else you know they're They're getting the memo from the same people. I'm guessing it's Alec. Uh, Hey, guess what, guys? Here's what you can do to kneecap your medical marijuana laws that your people just passed. Get on it. And so this was a couple days. This is last week, too. Medical marijuana status incidental to busted veterans. So because they don't even want to look at this thing and pass their own medical marijuana law, who knows what they're going to do for people that come in To their state with medical marijuana. Right now they're not they're not doing anything but arresting you. So Matthew Crane from Veteran Respond says he was targeted by law enforcement for possessing a small amount of medical marijuana. On his way to the Dakota Access Pipeline. So while North Dakota struggles with implementing its newly approved medical marijuana status, the U.S. Naval Veteran was cited in Morton County for possessing a few grains of marijuana from an out-of-state licensed dispensary. Matthew Crane, 33, of New York, was cited Friday while trying to reach the anti-Dakota access pipeline camps in what he described as a humanitarian mission to feed and assist veterans who are in the camps and help with the cleanup effort. Crane served from 2001 to 2006 in the avionics and ordnance support for a decorated combat search and rescue mission in Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, His honorable discharge was followed by a rough slide into civilian life. He is a recovering addict and had uh, repeatedly attempted suicide. His brother, also a veteran, committed suicide four months ago. He said that the prescription of those bits of marijuana in his medical kit, quote, it saved my life, pure and simple. Crane and three others in the vehicle encountered police while on the wrong side of the highway, 1806, a uh, protest roadblock after depending on a phone navigation system and following their local traffic doing the same thing. So basically, over there on 1806, there's this huge roadblock that they've been, you know, that the cops have set up, and it's been there for a while. It basically is to cripple the economy of the Standing Rock tribe because it's one of the main ways to get to the casino from the closest uh, population centers. 
And the casino, since it's run by the uh, tribe, is one of their main sources of income. Anywho, what he was saying was that they were using navigation and it got him on the wrong side of the roadblock. So what you don't want to do is pull up on the wrong side of the roadblock and then have weed on you in North Dakota, especially Morton County these days. Okay, according to a police report, the four occupants, including Matthew Crane, co-founder of the Veterans Responding Group, which is known to be at the Dakota Access Pipeline protest camps. One of the occupants turned over a smoking device identified as a pipe used to ingest marijuana. At that point, all the occupants and their luggage were removed from the vehicle and searched by the canine dog. A bag of marijuana was located in Crane's name on it. Crane acknowledged that possession of marijuana is illegal in North Dakota. He was cited for possession of marijuana and paraphernalia. Crane said he was looking for police because he knew he was lost and describes his encounter with the law enforcement as respectful and friendly. He said they all shook hands with the officers took and the officers took his, the veterans response business card to contact him if they encountered any veterans in need of any assistance. Crane said uh, his marijuana was in his medicine bag along with other VA prescriptions properly labeled. He said he was dumbstruck when Morton County later released a press statement on Monday uh, with him as a headliner for being cited with drug possession. The same release cited a South Dakota occurrence February 9th when another veteran and his friend, also on their way to camp on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, were arrested for possession of hash oil used for medical purposes. That man, Travis Biolette, had his vehicle and camping gear confiscated by police and was released Monday according to Veterans Respond. The combination of both arrests and the press release emphasis on the man's veteran status make Crane believe that the camp-bound veterans are being unfairly targeted by local police. Quote, if so, it's disgusting, absurd, and discouraging, Crane said. I'm honestly appalled at how I was treated by Morton County's public relations team and their leadership. His citation carries a March 28th court date. Morton County Sheriff Kyle Kirchmeyer said the officers weren't targeting the veterans for their connection to protest camps. Well, it was just uh, the re- it was just that was the reason that they were here. We have had no contact with them and with what they want to do. Uh, we didn't know their intentions or if they were associated with that stand with the Standing Rock group. Kirchmeyer said, "Now I've been to Standing Rock. Um, I went out there in September, and I gotta say, it, you know." Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell if if people are, you know, there for the for the protests. Who else is going to be driving around in the back roads of Martin County, you know? Um, and then a car pulls up on the wrong side of the the uh, roadblock and then tells you that they're lost and that they're veterans and then and then the ticket. So whatever, um, I've seen Kirchmeyer interviewed and lie his ass off time and time again about how the protesters are acting, about how his police are being, uh, are conducting their operations. And all I'm hearing from him is lies, so I don't trust a thing that he says. He said whether the marijuana was a prescription and for medical purposes was not an exception his officers could make. Quote, I don't know if it's my place to comment on what it was being used for. All I know is what the law says, and it's not legal in North Dakota, prescription or not, he said. Mark Sanderson is an executive director for Veterans Respond and said his group shouldn't be confused with Veterans Stand, the group that poured into the protest camps in December, raising more than $1 million in crowdfunding and vowing to protect protesters from police action. He, too, wants to know why Crane was called out in the press release for what amounted to a ticketable offense. Why put our, uh, out a press release with our name on it? We don't really understand why we're being targeted, and we're already in contact with the ACLU, he said. Sanderson said the Veteran Respond uh, mission at the protest camp in Standing Rock Sioux Reservation is similar to when the U.S. Air Force 82nd Airborne went to assist after, Haiti, after the Haiti earthquake. We did not come to get into a conflict with law enforcement. We did, we do not advocate nonviolent direct action. Uh, there's a lot of trash at the camp, and we want to clean it up. Sanderson said, "There are so many homeless and stranded veterans still here, uh, still there from December. We're feeding them, and we've already evacuated about 12 of them to a retreat center in Wisconsin." 
Sanderson said the police emphasis on the veterans' possession of drugs cast both their mission and their medical history in an unfair light. He said the group's main message to the North Dakota and, and to law enforcement is, we come in peace not to cause harm. And there you have that. Uh, North Dakota, it's a, it's a hellhole. <laughs> it's a hellhole. The cops are working for the corporate uh, oil gods and, you know, medical marijuana. The, the government of North Dakota don't want a fucking thing to do with that shit. If anything, they're going to slowly drag that program down to its knees and then shoot it in the back of the head. Um, and it's never going to actually take off. So we'll see. I don't know. When I think of North Dakota, I think it's even worse than Texas, man. All right. New Hampshire is next. What's going on in New Hampshire these days? Well, I'll tell you what. It's time to at least decriminalize marijuana everywhere. New Hampshire marijuana bill decriminalization advances and legalization bill killed. And I've, I think I said this about a week ago too. All these states that are popping up with, you know, you hear, oh, uh, the legislator over here and blah, 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 just put five different marijuana related bills on the floor, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like, it's like when you get, pulled over and they give you five tickets and you, you know, you look at them and they're all garbage except for one. <laughs> you're like, Oh, we're going to drop all of those. If you plead to a lesser thing on that one, that they're not going to drop. And that's kind of the way these laws are like, Oh yeah, you got recreational medical and decriminalization. That's the three big ones. And of course they're going to kill the, if they got that choice, they're going to be like, Oh, this is a choice. Ain't it one, two or three. Or put them in the order that you want of success, you know, and decriminalization, number one, medical, number two, recreational, number three. And they just shave the other two right off the bottom when they get to the end of the um, game. So it's the live free or die state. But you're not living free if you get caught with marijuana in New Hampshire because they still haven't decriminalized marijuana. They're one of the few states in the in that neck of the woods to not even do that yet. And if you look at it over there in the top left corner, what you see is you see that they're surrounded by what? Well, now they're surrounded by Vermont decriminalized since 2014. I think you have Canada right above you, um, where marijuana is legal. You have Maine right above you, where marijuana is legal. You have Massachusetts right below you, where marijuana is legal. You need to decriminalize or build more jails because it's the time has come. House Bill 640, sponsored by Bipartisan Coalition of Six Republicans and Six Democratic Lawmakers, would uh, reduce the penalty for marijuana possession of up to one ounce by someone 21 years or older, uh, to a violation punishable only by a fine. Fines would be set at 100 for the first offense, 200 for the second offense, or 350 for the third or subsequent offenses. So the graduation just stops at 350, and it don't look like it turns into a crime ever. So I guess that's okay, but it still sends the wrong message. It sends the message that not only are we making money off of you doing something that we think is wrong, but we're making money off of something that we think that you do is wrong. It's corrupt, man. It's just corrupt. Uh, the bill was advanced on a 14 to 2 vote. So what I'm saying is, like, if you're punishing people with fines, you're still punishing people. You're telling them that they're doing something wrong. Now, that's absurd. Why should you don't get a fine every time you get caught drinking? That's stupid. It's like, you're not my mom and dad, dude. Like, get this shit. Get these fines out of here. This is stupid. Or, you know, okay, oh, you caught me smoking marijuana because it's decriminalized. You're not going to give me a criminal record. Can we just not deal with fines? They're, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to make money off of people that get caught smoking marijuana. That's all it is. They think it's a big fucking game. Oh, no, we can't make money off of someone for smoking marijuana anymore. Yeah, well, you didn't in the first place. You were putting them in jail. That costs money. Your investigations cost money. Um, sitting there writing tickets takes time. You could be doing other things. It costs money. 
it's nothing but money out the door to enforce these marijuana laws that were never, they never had the intention of, um, of eradicating marijuana off the face of the earth. If anybody has that pipe dream still, you got to quit smoking that fucking pipe because it's never going to happen. You know, and for the DEA to still call marijuana a controlled substance is a joke. You failed to control it for 40 plus years. Way more than that, really. We're talking, we're rolling up on 80 years. You arrested millions of people. You spent trillions of dollars. And it's still, there's more marijuana than ever before, man. Failed. You failed. You can't control a weed, all right? House Bill 656 would have legalized the possession of up to one ounce of marijuana and five grams of hash and personal cultivation of six plants for adults 21 and older was held for a further study by a vote of 15 to 1. Don't forget that there. this is like you got six Democrats and six Republicans on there with this 16-person thing and whoever knows what the other uh, four is. But basically... Um, if you are out there, like, oh, the Democrats are legalizing marijuana all the time. They're the ones. They're cool. They're liberal. They're, they're progressive. They don't give a fuck about legalizing marijuana. Or that 15 to 1 wouldn't look like that. All right? So shut that up. Quit that. <laughs> Republicans definitely ain't sure. They're, they're, that one right there definitely is not a Republican. Or if it is, it's one of those new age Republicans that I keep talking about that for some reason, they I think they see an opportunity with marijuana that the Democrats are just too stupid to capitalize on. And that is that 60% of the population are, is for the legalization of marijuana for adults. 60%. And the 40% of Republicans, which is an off-the-chart number there, usually it's in the 20s for Republicans. So that's crazy. But in New Hampshire, apparently... They just want to sit there and bust people still, I guess. Even though the marijuana is legal all around their state. Most of the, you know, borders of their state, it's legal. Marijuana is legal on most of their borders. How's that going to work out? New Hampshire has fallen behind the rest of New England, of its New England neighbors when it comes to reforming marijuana laws. Possession of any amount of marijuana in New Hampshire is a misdemeanor punishable by up to one year in jail and fines of up to three fifty. The other five New England states have, at the very least, decriminalized possession of personal amounts of marijuana, eliminating the possibility of jail time and imposed only civil fines, according to the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Police in New Hampshire make around 2,900 marijuana possession arrests each year. That's a god-awful number, man. That is a lot. That's almost 100 a day. How, how do you have money to finance that operation that you got going on there doesn't make any sense how can you afford all those investigations how can you afford all those court cases how can you afford all the time that these people are spending in jail i know it ain't from the forfeiture because that ain't enough man i don't know what you're doing with possession it's not it's not nothing so, despite years of attempts to decriminalize marijuana possession in New Hampshire, the Granite State remains the only New England state where marijuana possession brings the possibility of jail time. The New Hampshire House approved decriminalization bills each of the last five years, only to see those bills die in the Senate. Voters from the two New Hampshire's neighbors, Maine to the north and Massachusetts to the south, legalized medical, or marijuana possession at the close of November. Newly elected Governor Chris Sununu uh, has said that he would support a marijuana decriminalization bill if it were passed by the state legislature. So just do it, guys. I mean, at the very least. And decriminalizing industrial hemp. Nullify federal prohibition. New Hampshire committee votes on this 18 to 0. HB uh, 151. New Hampshire House committee unanimously approved the bill. And this is probably that same committee that, you know, didn't want to vote for recreational marijuana. Well, hand them a hemp thing, and they're like, okay, cool. Well, okay, then, I guess. Um, it would open the door for a full-scale commercial hemp market in the state by treating it as any other crop for farming. It would not require any license to grow hemp. It would, not, it would create no state regulatory structure. In short, 
The state would treat industrial hemp like other plants, such as tomatoes. By ending state prohibition, residents in New Hampshire would have an open door to start industrial hemp farming should they be willing to risk violating ongoing federal prohibition, which isn't a really big deal. I think they'll look the other way if enough people do it. So let's get let's get going on this hemp stuff, everybody. I'm sick of it. You can make anything out of hemp. We, this country can have a new economy. You know, you hear people talk about a green economy. The, hemp is literally the greenest economy there is. You grow more plants. You use the plants instead of industrial things to create things like plastic, um, biofuels, you name it, anything. You can make concrete out of it. That's uh, The concrete you make out of it um, will basically cause your house to create a negative carbon footprint. Um, I don't know. Just it's the it's there's nothing greener than than hemp, and we need it. We need it for the economy. We need it for the environment. Um, let's do this. Let's go big or go home, man. It's I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of seeing states like Michigan dragging their feet. They're not even doing the research at the at the uh, colleges like everybody else already has. So. Come on, get it together, guys. Well, you know, down south is just no compassion. And, I mean, Wisconsin, too, and there's a, it's not just down south, but down south it just seems like there's, there's very little compassion. If there was any compassion, Florida would get their shit together because there's a lot of old people in Florida. And, uh... Medical marijuana is definitely, it definitely has the safest side effects, if not no side effects at all. It's the, it's the best thing for old people. You're reading stories, there's more and more stories coming out about how old people are, are, you know, are smoking more marijuana than ever before. This is the generation that is famous for the 60s being, you know, the counterculture explosion and marijuana and LSD and all these psychedelic drugs and all these psychedelic bands and these uh, hippie movements, <clears throat> these war anti-war protests that we don't see anymore, even though there's more war now than ever before. But anyway, um, yeah, those people finally came out of the closet and it turns out they're making noise with that. They're a big group. They're a huge group of marijuana users and I don't know, I'm just going off on a tangent, but yeah, down south needs to get their shit together and have some compassion. But right now they don't, they have no compassion. And here's some more proof of it. Medical marijuana backers oppose Georgia's Senate plan to reduce potency. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about Joe, or Jim Jabo Wages and his wife Lisa, and... We're talking about their daughter, Sydney. It's, uh, it's one of the first families in 2015 to qualify for Georgia's then new medical marijuana registry. Since then, they've seen Sydney blossom. She's eating more, has better awareness of what's going on around her. Last week, they caught her laughing as her older sister tickled her stomach for, before bedtime, a reaction neither had seen in years. The 13-year-old who has autism and suffers from intractable seizures has benefited from the state's medical marijuana law, her parents said. But they're afraid others won't. While proponents have sought a broad expansion of uh, Georgia's limited legalization of medical marijuana and found a likely refuge in the state house, uh, the Georgia Senate this year is moving to downsize a key component of the nascent program. In doing so, it has alienated dozens of families and children who use cannabis oil to help treat debilitating conditions. Senators wanting to reduce the maximum THC level in the cannabis oil now allowed from 5% to 3% say the move would bring the state more in line with others that also allow limited forms of the oil. Federal officials continue to classify the oil as an illegal drug. So let me go back here to this sentence. and Yeah, the... The other, there, he's talking about other states that only allow um, hemp-based CBD. And for some reason, Georgia didn't have access to real information and didn't know what the fuck they were doing when they wrote this law. And they weren't talking about 
a hemp based CBD uh, products when they did this so called compassionate medical marijuana legalization that they did. They did it so that the THC was on this low THC uh, status of cannabis so that you could get the CBD oil with as long as it had less than 5% of THC. Well, that's, you know, basically what a lot of the, uh, the CBD oil was back then. Now, I think the, the manufacturers are a little bit more precise with products and they have different levels of THC in different uh, products. Uh, but basically, the, differenti- the differentiation that they, that they thought they were doing was that, oh, these states have w- less than 1% THC on their laws, so what the hell are we doing with 5%? And he says as much. It's, it's just ridiculous. Come on, man. THC is medicine. And you guys keep you're talking about getting high. It's just ridiculous. So let's see what they're saying. If they cut it back this year, what's to say they won't cut it back again after that? Joe, Joe J-Bo wages asked, referring to the proposal in Senate Bill 16. You have some children who need more than 3%, he said, adding that one uh, rescue nasal spray used by some families to ease seizures contains 5% THC, which would be un- illegal under the new proposal. Under the 2015 law, patients... And in the case of children, families who register with the state are allowed to possess up to 20 ounces of cannabis oil to treat severe forms of eight specific illnesses, including cancer, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. The state proposal would add one more condition, autism, to the list. But that only, but only if the allowable THC is reduced. THC is a component in the drug that makes people high. While there have been no reported problems in Georgia with the state's low THC oil program, Some senators have expressed concern that the THC percentage is still too high. Let me just emphasize, I uh, I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall, because even the people that watch my videos, what just happened? Shit. I don't know. Even the people that watch my videos on a regular um, know that, you know, you're, you're, it's talking to the choir, but I want them to know that you are ignorant about THC. First of all, if you have one-to-one CBD to THC, um, usually the THC is not that effective. But if you have more CBD than THC, it becomes less effective. If you have exponentially more, like three times or more more, so if you have 15% CBD and 5% THC, now you're talking about the THC is not even a factor anymore. You're talking about THC is the component that makes people high. Not if you got a whole bunch of CBD in there, it don't. So while there have been no reported problems in Georgia with the state's low THC product, because there's never going to be a problem. It's not, there's there's nothing harmful about CBD, and low THC is not going to hurt you. Even if you do massive amounts of THC, you're not going to have any problems. Just unless you think people getting high is a problem, And I beg you to tell me why it's a problem with THC, but it's not a problem with opiates. It's not a problem with benzodiazepines. It's not a problem with opioids. Why? Why is it not a problem? Oh, they don't take enough to get high of those other ones. Yeah, they do. Are you kidding me, man? I woke up in a hospital one time, and they had Xanax dripping into my arm. Believe me, you get high off of it, man. So whatever. You know, don't tell me about this getting high bullshit. I'm just so sick of seeing it and hearing about it and for it being a factor. And meanwhile, children are suffering. And that's all I need to say about that. So many of the more than a dozen states that have low THC programs only allow percentages of one or lower. That's because they only allow hemp-based product. And hemp usually is definitely less than 2%, but I guess on average, it's, you know, when you manufacture the product and the the way you process it is you're going to get less THC anyway. And this is uh, your senator over here on the right in the background picture, William Ligon. Ligon? I don't know. He's a Republican from Brunswick. Listen to how stupid he sounds. 
Georgia is really off the charts. Really off the charts, huh? Because 5% THC is about what they say it was in that Mexican dirt weed that we all smoked when we were kids. Um, 5% THC, it doesn't really get you that high. It's not really a big factor. But it's, you know, to say that it's off the charts, and then he says, and we're dealing with a substance the federal government says is illegal. Okay, that's always the excuse of these Republicans in states where it's, uh, you know, you got people trying to change the marijuana laws or trying to do more with the marijuana laws that they have. The Republican kick fight back line is always, oh, come on, man, we got to be careful here. The federal government still says it's Schedule 1. And remember, the federal government's saying that because the United Nations told them to back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. So we got to keep that on Schedule 1 because the people up top always want us to be, you know, to fall in line and do what they say. These this re, Republicans are always for liberty or for death, or, you know. But yet, this is how they talk. We're dealing with the substance that the federal government says is illegal. They also said that they're not going to interfere with medical marijuana uh, people that are following the laws of their state. So that's a thing, too. Maybe you don't pay enough attention there, William Ligon. Well, anyway, this guy's a total fucking idiot and a hack, so whatever. I'm not going to give him any more attention. And his view is definitely clashing with what some say is the norm, at least for now, for those using or overseeing the use of oil in Georgia. So why don't he talk to them? You're supposed to be the representative. No, he don't care. He only represents Big Pharma, who wants him to say whatever they tell him to say, so that this shit don't go forward, or that so whatever they want to do. And remember, they wanted to put autism on as a qualifying condition. That should already be a no-brainer. You shouldn't make that, that's your bargaining chip. Like, okay, yeah, you guys can have your autism, but we're going to knock the THC down to under one. And you're just making people suffer, because that THC ain't going to get anybody any higher Dr. Ben Thrower works with multiple sclerosis patients as medical director of the MS Institute at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta. While the oil generally has not worked for everybody, some patients find it works well for symptom management without the strong sedating effect of standard treatment pharmaceutical drugs, he said. Ha! So, you know, here's actual patients saying, um, fuck you with this THC getting you high shit. You guys are giving me pharmaceutical drugs that are so sedative I can't even do anything. You know, I can't manage anything else but the pain. I'm just like, okay, take this for the pain and then see you later. Uh, no one wants to live like that anymore, man. He does not want to see the permissible percentage of THC lowered because it could have a direct effect on patients. Some may be fine with oils at 3% THC, he said, but others respond better to cannabidiol with a higher percentage THC. He sees having a greater range of options as a plus, not a minus. Right. Um, it's basically just saying it's just a little bit stronger anyway, man. You're not like, oh, hey, should we give somebody 80% uh, THC oil that only has 2% um, CBD in it? No, they're not saying anything like that. They're saying we still got like 80% CBD is it cool if we bump it up a little bit, you know, because actually if you take it down a little bit, it doesn't even register to a patient that it's working. And Trower says, uh, I don't feel like, we, we feel like we're going backwards if the THC is lowered, Trower said. I don't see any of my patients getting high right now. Most of my patients want to be functional. They want to participate in life. And so what if they get high on THC? You can still be functional. The Georgia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics opposes the addition of autism to the list, for example, because there's no science to suggest that it's uh, efficacious, the efficacious treatment for children with autism, said the chapter's executive director, Rick Ward. Ward has heard that what can often be powerful and emotional testimony from parents and patients at the Capitol but his member worry science has lagged behind those anecdotal stories. That's another thing that I'm so, so sick of. Rick Ward, you are a piece of shit. To sit there and listen to 
actual testimony from parents and patients who are dealing with these autistic kids and have, have you know, the options that they've been given to, to help them with dealing with the, these autistic kids and is drugs. I've, I know a lot of people with autistic kids. It's drugs. They want to give them um, Adderall. They want to give them benzodiazepine. They want to give them just stuff that just basically makes them zombies in heavy doses sometimes. And these are kids with autism, man. And different kinds of autism, different levels of different kinds of autism. And it's the same thing. They start with this pill, and if that don't work, add this to it. And if that don't work, give them some of that. They've developed new pills that are combinations of two or three pills from the past that they just got sick of prescribing someone three pills, so they stuck it all in one pill. And this dickhead Rick Ward's like, but, you know, we shouldn't put out there an option, you know, for CBD oil. That shouldn't be a choice. Are you fucking kidding me, you asshole? I'm so sick of this shit. You got parents that are telling you that it works better than this shit here, and these kids are functioning better, not just, you know, the, the symptoms are going away, but now they're zombies or now they're fucking sleeping, and then they're up all night, you know, a totally different story going on, you know, trade one thing for another. Uh, no, it just works, and you don't want to hear that shit because you got the pharmaceutical industry breathing down your back, Rick Ward. You're talking about there's no science that suggests that it's efficacious treatment for children with autism? Yeah, there is. I am fucking sick of hearing that shit, too. There's studies. You can find them. Why don't you uh, look at it? Why don't you look at real studies? Why, why does people always get away with saying this? Oh, I know. Because the press, I forgot who even covered this story. But nobody really asks them. Nobody, nobody catches them on that shit and says, well, wait a minute. What do you mean there's no science? Yeah, there is. There is science. We know what the CBD receptors... In, you, you ever heard of the endocannabinoid system, Rick Ward? Oh, no? Well, then fucking go back to school, dumbass. Uh, now, he is the chapter's executive director, and that's the Georgia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. What is pediatrics? That's the study of medicine for children, man. That's all it is. It's not the study of helping children get better or giving a fuck about kids. It's the study of how you can take medicine and apply them to kids. That's what it is. And of course they're going to be against something that works because they, they don't want nothing that works. You guys haven't figured that out, man. You haven't watched enough videos, not just from me, but from other people that have these, these problems in their life and have to deal with these things. These people like Rick Ward don't give a shit about any of you. Many Georgia's, Georgia officials, including Governor Nathan Deal, has said that the federal classification needs to change before the state laws can be expanded. Quote, the FDA didn't do us any favors last summer by keeping it on Schedule 1, Ward said. Um, CLA, again, Ward, you don't fucking know what you're talking about. That wasn't the FDA. That was the DEA back in August that said, no, we're not going to move it from schedule one and then later we found out that the fda told them yo you can't you that's not your job to schedule shit anyway um so the fda didn't do you any favors by you know whatever because that wasn't even the fda he noted that the academy had argued for marijuana to be reclassified as a schedule two drug a designation that would allow for more freedom with sanctioned use of drug in the medical research studies. We just support these things being studied. Now, I feel you there, buddy. I really do. But in the meantime, you can throw caution to the wind with cannabis because it's safe. It's never killed anybody. It's never hurt anybody. And it's anecdotal or not, these kids are getting better. He points to studies of cannabidiol's effect on intractable epilepsy that have included ongoing clinical trials in Georgia. Early results of those studies are trending positively, and Ward said that is Ward said that is the type of result that would make his members more comfortable with the oil's use on other conditions. Just give it to the kids now, man. The 
chapter has taken no position on THC percentage on the THC percentage issue. Ward says he don't care. <laughs> he knows the CBD is working for these seizures, and he's pissed. They were selling a whole lot more Xanax and Adderall before this guy, or before the uh, oil came along. Georgia Senate passed the medical marijuana plan opposed by the advocates. So this is an update. I did I did get around to that. Actually, this this still happened a while ago. This is February sixteenth. Um, yeah, so they passed it. So the THC is one, or no, the yeah. THC levels in cannabis oil not allowed here from 5% to 3%. Uh, the backers of the plan said would bring the state more in line with others that also allow limited forms of the oil. And autism was added. So they got their deal, they, they made their deal, and they shook hands in the back room, in, the, in that smoky back room that we all think of. And... The kids are the ones suffering, and those old patients with Parkinson's and MS and all, you know, those people, they're, they're going to they're gonna notice that 2% drop. Uh, THC is the component in the drug that makes people high again. Come on. They say cannabidiol has no medicinal value. Is just not true," said Watson, who is a medical doctor, to say that. Now he, his uh, agency also put in whenever you know whenever the there was the call for a reclassification of marijuana to Schedule Two, a lot of people put in on that. It wasn't just like one person was like, "Hey, guys, guys, what's up?" It took a, a gargantuan effort. Like there was a lot of people that put that pulled together for this one massive effort to do that. So it wasn't just one person. Um, yeah. Uh, that's it. And there's William Ligon. Lion Ligon. He just did no service at all to the people who are suffering. Then we have good old Governor... Hickenlooper? Colorado governor says California faces challenges in legalizing pot. Uh, the LA Times. So Hickenlooper was elected uh, after Colorado approved legalization and initially opposed it, but has since come around to believe to believe a, a regulatory system can work. It took Colorado official a year to reach an agreement to set the standard for what constitutes impaired driving, the governor said. The standard is met if a blood test finds 5 nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood. But the governor warned that it may be difficult for Californians to agree on a standard because people may argue that a particular level is too high or too low. And now 5 is definitely not too low. It's definitely low. It's way too low. Five is like you smoked a joint a couple days ago low, I think. I think in the 20s is still low. We think five is the right number, he said. We, we went through a lot of testing. Wow, dude. I think that is crazy. Proposition 64 does not set a standard, and California's police chiefs have called on the legislature to adopt a five nanogram standard, but marijuana activists say the measure is not a good way of determining impaired driving. And it isn't, because it doesn't matter what nanograms of THC you have in your blood. Different people have different tolerances. And then we got this other article that I pulled where, quote, we realize that we may have a new challenge with studying drivers who are under the influence of marijuana. And this guy is Glenn Davis, Highway Safety Manager for the Colorado Department of Transportation. The people that originally made the report that people keep quoting and saying how bad the program has been. It's not about the THC level, he says. It's about if law enforcement can prove impairment or not. California lawmakers asked Hickenlooper about the election of President Trump and whether he has led or that has led to more federal enforcement, given that marijuana remains 
illegal an illegal drug according to federal law. Hickenlooper said there has been some federal enforcement against illegal growers and gangs, but he thinks Trump will not order a crackdown in states where it has been legalized. <coughs> Quote, we're optimistic that he is going to let the experiment continue, the governor said. Uh, now remember, this guy was a beer slinger. He started out his life work by making craft beer. Um, so now all of a sudden he's running around talking about, you know, the finer points of the medical mar- or the, the marijuana law in Colorado and how it's bad, you know, and how the, the bad things about it. Here he is with his, his wine coops uh, brewing company. He's there in the left, highlighted. All right, so now he gets real about problems with marijuana in Colorado. Uh, what does that even mean? Want to know what Governor Hickenlooper hates? <laughs> Hickenlooper hates uh, the most about legal pot in Colorado. Well, just eavesdrop on him. And Tuesday afternoon in California, testifying in front of the state Senate, California has to figure out how to roll out retail weed in 2018, and the governor told him not to be stupid. Quote: We have such a looseness in home grows, and so we have we have had medical marijuana originally, and people could grow six plants per patient up to 99 plants and it's crazy well it's stupid it's a stupid system and i would encourage you guys to clamp down because it makes it very hard what you end up with is what we call the gray market uh so those folks are legally growing they don't need a license they don't have to fill out forms we don't check on their credentials or their criminal history and he's saying that they can grow 99 plants but he's acting like anybody can grow 99 plants that's just not true um, what he is talking about is the medical marijuana um, law where if you had all the patients that you could possibly have, you could it maxes out at 99 plants. And I don't think that's a big deal. He's acting like it is. He's acting like these people have so much extra weed that they go sell it, and next thing you know, you have a gray market. Um, then make it so they have a place where they can get rid of their weed. Man, I'm sick of this. This is like the third state I've heard where they're they're bitching about this extra weed because of this and that. But really, it's your fault for for writing laws that make these people basically stool pigeons sitting there with extra weed. Over the summer, the state put out an entire report about the gray market, which essentially means people are taking advantage of loopholes and distributing their large amounts of weed outside the tenant of the law. Now, that's funny because what it just said, outside the tenant of the law. It's not a gray market. It's an illegal black market. So if you do catch someone doing it, you can just you can pretty much prosecute them as if they were doing everything illegal, which is what they do in Michigan. If you have way too many plants, you're running a warehouse and they kick the door in. uh, Guess what? You're getting charged as if you didn't even have a single medical marijuana card. Because they knew that you were just using medical marijuana and getting cards and using that as a front for your illegal operation. And that's exactly what they're talking about here. They're not talking about an honest, straight-shooting medical marijuana caregiver who has patients growing too much weed and then, you know, setting up shop on the corner and slinging dime bags. It's just not even remotely what's going on. Um, And he's talking about what the feds did. They came in. It's because, and this is going on anywhere, and it's, it will go on anywhere as the markets emerge. Um, uh, illegal entrepreneurs decide that they want to run an illegal operation, and they go, it's, some, it's semi-legal. It's legal enough to not get noticed right away, and then they blow it up, and they make a lot of money and get out. Well, sometimes they get caught before they get the lots of money and get out part because of people that work for them usually, but... Bottom line is, is when when that happens, you treat that like it is. And it happens with a lot more things than just marijuana. Uh, he also didn't like talk very nicely about the edibles and the driving impairment, as well as whether the feds will crack down on legal pot. He says he's optimistic about Trump and Sessions, blah, blah, blah. Here's his gray market report that came out last August. Basically, yeah, telling you that, you know, that they have this gray market issue. Like I keep saying, they act like it's anybody that can grow plants is involved in this gray market. 
and that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, I I would encourage a gray market, to be honest, because it empowers individual people. If you're doing something good, I mean, obviously, if you're growing garbage, you're not going to be able to be involved in this gray market or any market. People are going to laugh you out. So it, patients can cultivate extra plants. you got caregivers that can cultivate this many plants. Each caregiver can cultivate up to 99 plants for patients. And then they just throw the whole 99 down into the gray market. Um, that's not how it works. If anything, you need to cut some of them down. I mean, all right. And then same with the patients. The patients are going to throw all six of their plants into the gray market too, apparently. <coughs> this just ain't realistic, man. This is just not realistic. This is just garbage. It's all hypothetical. Uh, you think this is what's happening, and it really isn't. Um, now, this list of things that they said did happen has nothing to do with the medical marijuana law, has nothing to do with their regular uh, law. You got Operation Gas Lamp. Uh, law enforcement uncovered a coordinated network of grow houses containing 45 firearms, a million in assets, with 1,800 plants and 100 pounds of harvested marijuana destined for Chicago and Florida. That doesn't say anything about how that market happened. It says this gray market activity has been evidenced by numerous uh, things, but it doesn't say how these are gray market related. You know, they, they just showed you back here that this is how gray market marijuana comes into play. That's bullshit. They say all these plants are plants that are accounted for are supposed to be for what it's for. You're saying that people got all these um, medical marijuana cards and just grew all these plants just to put it in the gray market. Okay. Operation Mountain Grass Cotopaxi. I don't even know what the fuck that is. In 2015, police seized 1,000 plants and 50 pounds of marijuana grown across nine properties of 28 firearms. It was intended for shipment to the East Coast markets. Again, doesn't tell you how they were gray market. Steamboat Springs, law enforcement uh, officials uncovered the remains of medical marijuana patient of who, whoa, in Steamboat Springs who had been violently murdered by a couple of his marijuana plants. Oh, for a couple of his plants. The couple was found in possession of 100 pounds of marijuana. I'm guessing the people that did it. All right, U-Haul and tractor trailer transporters. Police officer arrested two men on multiple occasions for attempting to transport over 150 pounds of marijuana from Colorado to the East Coast. One of the men stated that they had been transporting marijuana from Colorado for at least four years. Again, how has that got anything to do with this gray market? This sounds just like people doing illegal shit because they would do it anyway, whether whatever the laws may be. <laughs> I don't know. And then Aurora in 2016, law enforcement officials received information regarding marijuana trafficker who was brokering deals between a Colorado-based marijuana growers and several different buyers and distributors. The traffickers were shipping less quantities of marijuana from Colorado to customers located well, large quantities throughout the United States. Based on this information, law enforcement officials executed a search warrant on a residence in Aurora, seizing approximately eight pounds, four firearms, small active marijuana grow, grow equipment. A second search warrant was executed at a residence in southern Colorado and seized approximately 22 pounds of marijuana, 273000 in cash, 18 firearms, and three suppressor silencers. Who cares? So, you know, that didn't sound very big. Um, but numerous other gray market cases have been and continue to be documented out of Colorado. These are not gray market cases. Gray market is where someone actually legitimately has extra marijuana and they don't know what to do with it. They don't want to get busted, doors kicked in, or some robber come along. So they sell it. And then, you know, the people that buy it are buying marijuana for probably a little bit cheaper than we're at the legitimate place to go buy it. So this is that's the gray market. What they're talking about here is just straight-up illegal activity bullshit that happens everywhere all the time. Here's, they're talking about how we're going to get rid of the gray market. One of their ideas is, believe it or not, is this is uh, the, uh, pro the approaches to date. This is what they've done, and this is what has happened because of it. They're talking about plant count limits, attempt through regulations and legislation. They can't do that because uh, 
uh, like a lot of these bills, they pass by such large margins that you got to have a big majority to even get one of those passed. And plant counts are not going to, you're not going to change that shit. Um, and then they tried to change, like, what you can even get medical marijuana for to try to cut down on the amount of patients. Um, they tried to do everything, man, and none of it works, all right? Amendment 20, whatever that is, is garbage. Or no, Amendment 20, I think that's the medical marijuana program. I'm not sure. Anyway, here's what they want to do. Work to adopt modified definition of assist to limit home growth to qualifying individual president, uh, primary residents. Hmm. That's probably not going to pass. All right. Explore hard plant count limit that brings us in line with other states or tie legal ability to register as a caregiver or grow as a patient to compliance with local zoning restrictions. Again, that sounds like a behemoth uh, adjustment. Probably won't pass. Create low-tech tagging system for plants that allow local law enforcement to check if plants are being delivered to patients. Bullshit. That's garbage. Um, like I said many times, uh, you guys don't know how to uh, control substances. When it comes to marijuana and marijuana plants, really big fail there. So good luck with that one. Um, and then they're thinking, let's increase funding and resource for state and local law enforcement. More cops, more spying, more narking, more, uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's get right back to before it was legal. You know what, guys? Marijuana is legal. Why don't you just chill the fuck out, man? If someone's doing something illegal, bust them. Don't try to change your laws to fuck over the people that fought really hard to get those laws the way they are. And by the way, it's going to be really hard for you to do any of that anyway. So quit trying, man. And there's your governor. I don't know how much longer he's got to go, but, man, for a Democrat, he sure doesn't sound like marijuana's best friend, does he? Lieutenant Governor of Virginia calls for decriminalization of marijuana. Um, I think there's a governor's race in Virginia, and I think I heard that the majority of candidates are for this decriminalization and a couple of them are even for legalizing recreational across the board for adults. Um, that sounds like Virginia's heading in the right direction. And I feel like Virginia, you're still like one of those almost New England East Coast feeling places, especially if you're up in the northern part of Virginia. So uh, like they're probably feeling that, you know, keeping up with the Jones uh, Joneses thing when thinking about, you know, Massachusetts, Maine. Uh, decriminalization, though, that's a that's that's a short jump. All right, that's not much. All right, and file this one under good people do smoke marijuana, Mister Sessions. We have George Zimmer, the guy that uh, you know, I don't know, men's warehouse commercials. I'm sure everybody's seen this guy on TV. If you ever turn the TV on. You've probably seen this guy's commercials, but he uh, he's not just a marijuana smoker. He's a advocate, big time, and kind of sounds like he basically says that he smokes marijuana as kind of like a uh, just to piss people off, he said. <laughs> I don't know. I think it makes him happy. I think it makes his life complete, um, and uh, yeah. So here we have a tweet about Harris County. Now, I'm going to go through a video uh, right after this. But Harris County, they're, they're doing this kind of diversion program. So if you have up to four ounces of weed, then you can qualify for this diversion program, which is total garbage. But this four ounces of weed is also total garbage. And, you know... To say that if you had more than that, then you're definitely going to get charged with a crime, that sucks too, because that's not really that much weed. Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg said Thursday morning announced a new marijuana policy that she said would save the county millions of dollars and free up resources to focus on prosecuting violent crimes. The new misdemeanor marijuana diversion program, which takes effect on March 1st, 2017, will divert all misdemeanor marijuana cases involving up to four ounces out of the criminal justice system instead of 
uh, redirecting low-level drug offenders to a decision-making class. This decision-making class is like a four-hour dealio, 150 bucks, and that's what they're doing. They figure they'll get so many people into that that it'll not only pay for itself, but it'll also give them a little bit of money on top of it instead of having to spend money on all these drug cases, which I told you earlier, there's, these drug cases are burying people's economy, man. And it was part of a, a long time ago, part of Normal's campaign to tell people, like, if you ever get caught with marijuana, demand a jury trial. It's your right, you know. Especially if it's your second or third offense, you, you better get a jury trial. And they, then they tell you about jury nullification and all that crap. Well, it, you know, we're back to that same, that same game now. Now we've flooded the courts. It worked. They're sick of seeing marijuana cases filling up the docket. And it does. They do fill up the docket. Um, yeah, let's watch this video. This, she'll explain it to you. <laughs> If you are stopped in your car on the street and you are found by law enforcement to be in possession of a misdemeanor amount of marijuana, you will be advised that this program is available. You will be advised if you're eligible for the program. The law enforcement officer will contact the DA's office to approve the stop and make sure that the stop itself was lawful, that probable cause existed. If you are found if you are found to be eligible, you will be offered a chance to sign an acknowledgement form promising to take a decision-making class. Cognitive decision-making class. What is that again? <laughs> um, now, I'm not sure if this cognitive decision-making class has a graduated system of every time you get caught, it costs more. I don't know. It takes four hours and costs $150. Ouch. You'll be required to do that within 90 days. If you are too poor to afford the program, we will make arrangements for you. You simply have to contact us in the probation department. Yeah. I bet you there's, I mean, there's no way that that 150 is free, buddy. And that uh, will be explained in the form that is provided the offender. The contraband will be seized. Upon completion of the class, it will be destroyed, and you will have no criminal record. Ouch. Why you got to destroy the weed? You're making, you're making someone go to a decision-making class and pay 150 bucks. The least you can do is let them keep their weed. If you fail to take the test, I'm sorry, if you fail to take the class, and fulfill your obligations that you've promised the officer and our office that you will complete, then an arrest warrant will be issued and you will be arrested for misdemeanor possession. And then they have to deal with you. We are and it's going back to, to the courts our again. Statistics. We are going to monitor this program this is kind all of their, the way through. Way to, to get back at us for overflowing their court systems with marijuana cases, like it's our fault. The evidence shows if there are repeat offenders and they are uh, bordering on the serial level, committing the same crime over and over, then we'll adjust that. Wow. Program. So it might not be a graduated system now, but believe me, you don't want to be a repeat offender. And make arrangements to treat them differently. They'll treat you differently. That there are more indigent people than we thought, then the cost may You know change. what? She already knows that that's not going to happen. There isn't more indigent people getting caught smoking marijuana because every time someone gets pulled over, there's a 50-50 chance you're going to find marijuana just because everybody's got marijuana. And this is Texas we're talking about over in the Houston area. They're really hardcore over there about marijuana. They're one of the most strict states going down. But comparatively, in terms of being arrested, going through the booking process, going to jail, having a stigmatizing conviction, even a record for deferred, it stops people in their tracks. It changes their path in life. It limits their It just makes them be a little more careful next time we're depriving about where they stash their roach after they smoke. The strength that it needs yep. to meet um, the challenges of a growing economy in this region. Apparently, shit, that's what it's like these days. They, they're sick of the court cases themselves, so... How do they get rid of them? 
that sounds like what they're heading towards. Um, my solution, instead of diversion, uh, legalize marijuana, all right? Because you, you're still hampering these people with this extra burden of having to go to some class for four hours and pay 150 bucks for it. That's, that's just, that's wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't really have nothing more to say about that except for I can't hate it, but man, it's, it, it's, it's dog shit. It, it's not the way, the direction that the rest of the country's heading. Um, overall, over half of the country's heading towards legalized marijuana. And uh, I'm going to keep doing these stories because there's just too many of them coming out. Uh, all these stories I just did here, this took a week to put together, and they're already up for updates. Um, this is the end of the uh, week, the first podcast. The first podcast. Uh, it's not actually a podcast yet, but it's a podcast. And I don't know how long it is, but it's pretty long. And probably going to do this about once uh, every few days. So stay tuned. And I'll keep you informed and updated about all the different things going on in the marijuana laws around the country, as well as. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to get back to some other stories too. Like we had Duterte over there in the Philippines. He's still killing people and there's still hit squads, vigilante squads out there killing people uh, in the name of a drug war. Um, we have Mexico. We have a drug war there. Not only that, but we extradited uh, El Chapo, world's most notorious kingpin, uh, famous for chopping people's heads off. Who knew? He started his career off selling marijuana. Who knew? Why has Mexico got such a bad drug war? Oh, yeah, that's right, because everybody down there is competing to sell us drugs because America has a drug problem, and the problem is prohibition. Prohibition is empowering these gangs, and that's why El Chapo became who he was. Um, One last quick update is I heard that South Carolina... It has some medical marijuana laws on the floor. Good luck. I hope that something positive happens there. Um, I think there's also stuff in the legislature to kneecap the already terrible, barely a program, medical marijuana compassion thing for people, you know, mainly kids with the uh, seizures and stuff. So, I don't know. That's all I got for this week. Um Subscribe, like, share, all that stuff.